Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on The Cognitive Crucible is Kalev Litaru, who is a global advisor to governments, NGOs, and the world's largest corporations to help them solve tomorrow's greatest challenges in an ever more uncertain world. Kalev Litaru, welcome to The Cognitive Crucible. Thanks so much for having me. The conversation I'd like to have with you today will cover the GDELT project, and GDELT stands for the Global Database of Events, Language, and Tone. But before we get into this topic, Kalev, could we start by getting your overall comment and assessment of the landscape that we find ourselves in today? You know, it's it's, it's a fascinating world that we're in right now. Um, you know, there are... Uh, so Steven Pinker, in, in one of his recent books, uses one of my graphs from a couple of years ago, which traces out global media tone. And, and I trace it out through two ways. One was through the New York Times and looking from 1945 to 2005, the overall tone of all coverage in the New York Times by year. And one of the interesting things about that was uh, you know, the New York Times, to its, its sort of reputation as the quote unquote gray lady, was, was pretty stable for a while. Um, but then in the 60s and 70s, um, really collapsed in tone. And according to the New York Times, that was sort of the, the most turbulent uh, period, um, where even kind of modern times don't, don't nearly uh, compete with that. And um, it is interesting when you kind of look at, you know, kind of, uh, and, and in particular, when we, when we kind of think about like today's moment, we say, oh my God, look at all the things that are happening around the world. The world is collapsing. Um, to remember that as we go backwards through time, um, you know, the, the current times are not always uh, as, as crazy, you know, to us, because we live in the moment, they seem like, my God, the whole world is collapsing. And that's actually one of the ideas of GDELT is this idea of being able to put things in historical context. And if you look at one of the other graphs, the one that he actually puts in his book is, is from BBCM, so sort of the British counterpart of what used to be Phibus and, and now is um, the OSC. Um, from 1979 uh, to 2010, I think I looked at in that data and traced out, and that you know that covers all of all of BBCM's monitoring around the world. And what was so fascinating about this is you see it kind of steady, steady, steady until the sort of mid 90s, early to mid 90s, as the first web-based news really starts rolling out, and then as web-based news accelerates, you see the tone of media across the world collapse in the free fall. And what's so fascinating about this is at first glance that might suggest sort of the 90s was when the entire world just collapsed and the, the world just fell to pieces. But if you look more carefully at that graph, what you see actually is that this is this, co this correlates almost flawlessly with the rise of web news. And this is a very interesting moment because rewind the clock 40 years ago, if I'm sitting in a small town in somewhere in the United States, my news was typically local news, and that local paper did not compete. I mean, yes, the New York Times, et cetera, but that was a relatively small, uh, you know, relatively small um, uh, universe. And I think back, um, I was at the University of Illinois for my undergrad, computer science, um, but I remember we had a newspaper library going down there, and you could get these newspapers from all across the world, except they shipped them, uh, you know, slowest shipment possible. So typically, if you picked up a newspaper from Russia, um, it was one to two, maybe even three months old. And you know that was just incredible by itself to actually be able to hold a newspaper and see news from other parts of the world. But it was so out of date, it, it wasn't something that competed with local news. But in the web era, every news outlet in the world competes with every other news outlet in the world. And this means that you know if, if I, as they say in the journalism world, what bleeds leads. If I write and say, you know, you, you'll never see an article that says, it's a wonderful day out today, everything's going great, uh, because that doesn't drive clicks. I mean, even CNN today, uh, you know, it, you'll see the clickbait there. You'll see the Tiger Woods did what today? And that's not something you saw in mainstream media. That tended to always be kind of those, those odd clickbaity corners of the world. And so this is a this is a huge thing now as we we, you know, think about the world in which we live in the rise of electronic news, the rise of, of sort of this 
attention economy um, you know, we don't have a captive audience. You don't have time for these long. I mean, think about investigative journalism is really collapsed. So there is, you know, if you look at the data, you do see as our information access has intensified, um, the world looks like a darker, more unsteady, more dangerous place. And, you know, even protests, and this is actually a really interesting one. So we used um, the available digital news that exists today. And we plotted this out over the last, I think, 40 years, global protest intensity. And what you see is protests just explode across the world. And this is not necessarily the, the case. What the, what the actuality is, is 40 years ago, two people on a street corner here in Washington, D.C., maybe the National Mall holding up a sign, was not going to garner international news coverage. Today, some media outlet somewhere, someone will tweet about that, and that will get some out, some coverage somewhere in some outlet in some corner of the world. And so that becomes visible to us in a way that historically these things were never visible to us. The, essentially, if you think about it, the threshold at which we see things. So 40 years ago, a protest of a million people probably was going to be something we would see. A protest of two people, probably not. Uh, today, we will see those two people. So in other words, that it, it raises our awareness of the world and it makes us, uh, and so there's sort of two things, the accessibility of information makes us really see the world and makes it seem like, boy, there's always something happening everywhere. Um, two, the way in which media competes with each other, they're sort of intensifying, uh, cataloging all that. And then three, again, it's that, that historical context that we always, as analysts, we always live in the moment and we forget the historical context. And, you know, to me, uh, you know, my, my father is, uh, you know, he, he loves uh, history. And, you know, when I was a kid, he always used to teach me, you know, the history of Rome and, you know, all these uh, ancient uh, civilizations. You look at, you know, a lot of those, you say, my God, look what, you know, look what happened back then. And you think about today, because people, you know, they say, my God, you know, look at what's occurring. We've never in history of humankind ever seen something like this. Well, this doesn't even compare to the past. So put it in context. And um, this becomes also very interesting in terms of a couple of years ago, what was that, five, six years ago, they had the, the, uh, the fires in Greece. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there were some protests. And I'll, I'll never forget this because I was working with a, a very, very um, major internationally known organization and presented them with this analysis of what was happening in Greece. And they said, well, that can't be the case because I'm seeing on the news every day, uh, you know, most of Greece is in fire. These protests, you know, they, they set the entire country on fire. And I said, well, that's actually two different things there. And they said, no, no, no. When I look in the news, I see, you know, yesterday on CNN, I saw some coverage of protests and I saw just coverage of the entire country on fire. Uh, you know, they're even, you know, even uh, uh, forests are on fire. Well, no, that's that's two different things. And it, it never, they were never able, because again, it's this sort of this connection to the world. Um, they were never able to distangle that those were actually two different events. To them, it's, well, Greece is some faraway country, so it's all one little thing. And I think that is a, a danger, that that lack of contextualization and also just the access to information. Uh, you think about, um, and this I think is a really crucial point, is gatekeepers and intermediaries. So rewind the clock and you know think about um, the, the landing on the moon. Uh, that was, you know, the average person was not getting those live feeds from NASA of, you know, all the different uh, radio traffic and cameras and uh, specific, you know, everything. What what the average person saw was what was what was being intermediated on the media. So in other words, they would turn on their television and they would see this carefully scripted, summarized, uh, you know, sort of dumbed down uh, thing about what's happening, even with Apollo 13. You didn't, uh, you know, there was concern, but you didn't have, you know, the, imagine if the ordinary person could see the live technical readouts and all those rockets and start, you know, wildly diagnosing what they think uh, is, the, is the cause and what they think needs to happen to get, the, to get them back. And, you know, today that's what we have. And I think the, there's a certain something when you lose that, that sort of that interpretation, that contextualization by experts uh, I do think now again that can go that can go the wrong way as well. But I do think this this raw access where, you know, we we see, um, uh, you know, maybe it's it's uh, uh, I mean just just everything today this this raw access. I mean even something like in um, Ukraine's an interesting example where uh, as you know people see you know you have this this cacophony of information some real some disinformation uh, you know misinformation you have sort of this this wildfire of information. And a lot of well-meaning people that just go online, grab something that looks vaguely Ukrainian, Russian-ish, and repost that as if this is something that's happening right now. 
And, you know, so that, that flood versus having that kind of, well, hey, here's something maybe from the BBC. Maybe they've vetted it. They've actually spent the time to say, yes, this video is real. This is actually here. We vetted every detail of this. Uh, we've looked at the provenance of that. And I think this is a key. Now, of course, right now, the deep fakes and, uh, the, and the, the computer generate misinformation, we're right on the cusp uh, of where that is going to become a, an actual major issue. Uh, and, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But to me, the solution to that um, really comes down to provenance. Um, without gatekeepers, uh, you know, I get this flood of information. Uh, in fact, a good example of this, um, Turkey. So just look last week, uh, you know, the uh, I was actually on the ground in Turkey, in, in uh, Ankara, um, when the rumor spread that uh, Erdogan had had a heart attack and was hours, and literally, you start seeing all these like frantic messages from editors and, and journalists around the world uh, saying, you know, what are you hearing? What do you know? Uh, you know, we're, we're hearing he's an hour from death. That was, you know, a social media you know, there was video that circulated showing world leaders rushing back to their, uh, you know, places to prepare for the transfer of power. And, you know, you look around, you say, well, on the ground, this certainly does not feel like, a, you know, like a government that's, uh, you know, rushing to uh, prepare for a transfer of power. Um, and most importantly to me, what I looked at is I said, you know, look in the mainstream media. I'm not, you know, the mainstream media, I'm seeing all these editors asking these questions. But I'm not seeing the mainstream. I'm not seeing BBC blaring, you know, Erdogan an hour from passing. Um, that was on social media. And that's something that people talk about of, well, you know, social media. It was really funny because I, in the aftermath of that, in the 24 hours after that, got a lot of notes from people saying, see, this proves that Twitter and social media are so much better than mainstream media because, look, BBC wasn't running the story that, you know, Erdogan is, is an hour from passing. Uh, that was on Twitter that we saw that information. Well, and again, I, I have no idea what the reality is, but I'll say that the following day, he did a video talk, and what was that, two or three days later, he's on the campaign trail again uh, in typical full form. Someone that was an hour from death typically isn't going to be back up and running again a day later. And so, you know, this is, I think, one of those things that we see across the world is that unfiltered, raw sort of echo chamber of information. And people also don't realize, I mean, even with Ukraine, um, you know, all the falsehoods that are spreading around there, um, you know, some of that is economically generated. I, you know, put out an article, I want a lot of clicks there to sell ads. Some of that, though, again, there's a lot of motivations. People kind of forget, even people that are aware of the information, the information battlefield, they don't, you know, suddenly they suspend disbelief. I mean, think about when Donald Trump was elected. This is actually a really interesting example. When Donald Trump was elected, um, rewind the clock. Uh, remember, there were all these alt accounts on social media. So on Twitter, there was the alt commerce department, the alt national parks. Every, every, basically every um, U.S. government agency that had a, a social media account, there was suddenly an alt account that sprung up. And what was interesting to me about these is that these alt accounts began fundraising. They set up fundraising accounts that said, donate to us to resist. And what was so fascinating to me is that um, all of these uh, academics, and what was even more amazing is so many of the misinformation experts that are out there, specialists in mis and disinformation, uh, they all suddenly signed up and started donating to all these and, and encouraging all their people. I mean, I was getting just all this deluge of stuff saying, we have to donate, we have to donate. My question was, well, Who's behind these accounts? Do you know any of these people? No, but it, it has to be. They're they're you know they're they're resisting Donald Trump. Uh, you know they're these brave people, and you know I said, well, who's behind these? I mean, surely, obviously, as disinformation researchers, you must have done some vetting. Well, no, but it doesn't matter because they're you know they're aligned with me, so it doesn't really matter who they are and what they are. And again, to this day, I don't know who's behind those accounts. But that to me was a real wake up call too that this actual community. The moment, you know, the same people say, well, you know, don't believe what you see on the internet. You have to do this research. You have to do this research. The moment it was aligned with something that they cared about, suddenly that went out the window. So again, that that gatekeeping environment where, um, and with deep fakes, I think this is going to be a real, a real, real key is if I see a video that circulates, like, for example, some of this video that, you know, circulated earlier today of smoke rising over the Kremlin, uh, you know, my initial question was, Hey, there's smoke rising over the Kremlin. Is this a CG video? It kind of has those hallmarks of, you know, grainy cell phone video. But, you know, again, and, and that's an interesting one too, where you have mainstream media, um, some reporting it, some not. Uh, and so this is where uh provenance is, is really crucial. Um, if we and people ask, well, how are we going to defeat deep fakes? And my answer to that is, you know, today there's, you know, a cottage industry of companies that claim to have tools that can detect these deep fakes. And you know the 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 thing is it's a cat and mouse game, and what people don't understand outside the community is these new generative tools. There's something called GAN, um, uh, uh, generative adversarial networks. 
Um, the adversarial network is the key part of that acronym. And what that means is basically this model, essentially, you take this model and you hand it a detector um, and you say, basically, so in the case of like deep fakes, they're designed to keep basically working around, um, to basically essentially keep working around whatever their input is. And so if you hand them a detector and say, here is a deep fake detector that can currently detect you, as a programmer, I'm not having to sit there and figure out, well, how do I defeat this detector? What are his vulnerabilities? That are, you literally connect it to, and you just say, here's this detector, keep working until this says, uh, until this detects, no longer detects you. And you just walk away and it just sits there, it's just compute time. And then it, it finds its way around the detector. So every new detector, you just toss it in and it finds its way around it. So the idea of like detectors, um, you know, that that's a really interesting, I, I, I you know, you will have a, a nonstop stream of those, but they're not long-term. The only real long-term is provenance. And the, the, exam, the, the metaphor I give for this is art. So in the art world, um, we have an identical scenario. Uh, a new Picasso shows up. Um, it's been in storage for 40 years. Somebody found it in their attic. Um, it's the unheralded masterpiece that nobody knew about. And in the art world, this happens every day. And um, what, what, what happens there, so they'll come up with a new detection, maybe uh, a new x-ray technique that looks at maybe how paint is layered. So now they can detect all the forgeries. But now that that's, that's public knowledge, now the forgers know, okay, when I, whatever, you know, I need to use a new technique to defeat that. So now like just um, a couple of months ago at the National Gallery here in Washington, DC, um, they had um, this beautiful exhibit about um, some of the newer techniques with some of this multi-spectral and really, really fascinating new techniques they're using where they caught um, one of the paintings in the gallery that was believed to be a forgery. They were able now to finally determine that. But again, not that's public forgers will find a new way around it. In the art world, the only thing that really matters, so if you can show that, hey, based on every known technique, this passes, you can say, hey, there's a high likelihood that this is a new work that we just didn't know about. But the only way that is truly trusted as absolute is provenance where I have a complete uh, complete line basically of receipts and ownership from the painting leaving the workshop to it appearing in my hands today. And I think that's what we're going to have to do on the web is kind of this, this chain of custody, this chain of provenance. Um, but again, so that's sort of a long-winded way of saying that at some point, you know, we, we might say, wow, the world is just in this dangerous place. A lot of it just comes down to the accessibility, the of the accessibility of information, the um, you know, sort of the, the media's um, increasing competition with each other. And then just simply the fact that we live in the moment, um, whatever moment we live in, we are going to believe is worse than the past, uh, simply because that's how we are psychologically wired. And it is fascinating to me when you start talking to psychologists about how we understand the world, the mental models that we create. And that's actually one of the areas where machines can be so useful is that machines are able to help snap us out of that. And in fact, one of the most powerful ways that we are finding that machines are useful in this regard is to be able to put in historical context my current event. And, and this comes up every day. Someone says, well, look at media. They're covering whatever the topic is in a way that they've just never covered this before. We've never seen media coverage like that. And you know, in the US, um, in collaboration with the Internet Archive, we searched CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News back to 2009. And so every day, someone you know says, "Well, you know, look at media; they're covering inflation in a way that they've never covered before." Well, let's rewind the clock. Is that real? Is that not? And oftentimes, that's not the case. Uh, you know, even just within 10 years of three channels, we can show. Well, you're, again, your perception, and it's people say, "Well, gee, I don't even remember that." Well, again, that that's the that's how the human brain works. So again, data can be so so powerful. I do think, however, that one of the actual inflection points, though, um, the accessibility of all this information really does change the game in terms of how we communicate, um, how we understand the world. Uh, the accessibility of falsehoods is a huge deal. If you think about airbrushing, I mean, you know, the, the term airbrushing uh, has a very, very long history of this. Uh, you know, people say, well, you know, we've never had falsehoods before. Well, gee, you know, study, uh, uh, study Russian uh, Soviet propaganda, uh, just as, as one minor example. Uh, and you know, quite convincing in some cases. I mean, you know, there, there's some there's some there's some airbrushed photographs there that even if you kind of stare at it, you really can't see where they modified it. But the amount of skill it took to do that meant that that was a small and even you know Photoshop. I mean, since the dawn of the internet, people Photoshop things, but it took real skill to make things that that were passable. The difference now is the accessibility to anyone. So kind of the 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 sheer volume of data. So. 
uh, you know, you think about information scarcehood. So if we rewind the clock, um, a lot of analysis was we don't have access to much. I mean, even be, you know, even look at Phibis's history uh, back to, you know, if you look all the way back to 39 with the Princeton Listening Center and FBMS and then on through Phibis, it really was a, an issue of scarcity. You have teams of human beings deployed across the world, but they can't possibly, you know, they're clipping newspapers, they're listening to broadcasts, they're ex it's very an excerpt centric modality where you can do really, really interesting things from that. But still on the front line, you have human beings that are sitting there that are excerpting what they think is very important. And in 2009, I, I did a piece actually for studies um, looking at the history of Phibis and BBCM and kind of what they collected across the world. And you can see the pivot away from Russia and China right as they became more important. Um, you can see a pivot away from Osama bin Laden uh, because that's just not someone who's important. It's not someone who's gonna matter to American history. Um, and this is this is one of the challenges is that when you have these these human beings that are embedded in these areas, um, in some cases they're really good at filtering things. In other cases, they're not because they're embedded in that environment. They're not in, you know, they're not, except with the benefit of hindsight, able to say, hey, you know, there's something odd here. And so uh, that is a challenge. Now, rewind now, kind of fast forward to today, it's quite the opposite. We have an unlimited volume of information that's out there. Uh, and so it's kind of the opposite of we have this fire hose that we're having to make sense of and really is cacophony, especially with social media, with citizen media, with um, kind of the rise of, of mainstream media and also the cost of media. Um, the cost to run a radio or television station was cost prohibitive. Uh, the cost to run a, a video you know, channel on social media today is, is nothing. And so it sort of turned everyone into a broadcaster and the ability to remix and the fact that mainstream media uh, monitors um, social media is driven by it. CNN for, I don't know if they still do, but for a, a long time, had a dedicated team that would drive the news cycle um, from social. In fact, we actually showed a couple of years ago with First Draft, um, they're, a, a, a they're an organization that studies misinformation. Uh, we were actually able to show that Donald Trump was able to drive mainstream media outlets through his tweets. He would actually, based on his tweet cycle, we could show that he could essentially set the news agenda for traditional cable television um, by his tweets. And this is really powerful because we kind of say that, well, social media exists in a vacuum, mainstream media exists in a vacuum. Uh, they act as these counterbalances to each other without really realizing just how much they drive each other. Um, and then finally, that you know, AI, both as a generative model, this ability to create new information. Um, take the the Pope in a puffer jacket, where someone created this, uh, you know, this image of the Pope wearing a puffer jacket, and that spread. Now that's where provenance matters, because with provenance, and and this is what's interesting, the technology exists. Uh, you know, today in Google Chrome, you can pull up uh, any image, right click on it, and say search with Google Lens. And it will do a reverse Google image search across everything that Google has found in the web and track down the original source of that. And doing that with the Pope in a puffer jacket, you immediately saw, oh, this came from, I think it was a Reddit uh, uh, thing, uh, thread on fashion. This was not intended to misinform. This was just somebody showing, hey, isn't this a cool approach that got repurposed? And that's a big thing. Um, that was a deep fake. But what we do see is a lot of the, the, the quote unquote falsehoods are real images. They're not digitally manipulated that are simply repurposed with a new caption. Um, but again, what's interesting in the Pope in a puffer jacket is the moment that it started being, that the message starts spreading, hey, you know what, this is not real. Uh, that's when what we saw was this kind of this flood then of people in real time using mid journey and other tools to make alternative angles of it. Because that's kind of, you think about it, I see one image, you say, okay, well, that's fake. Well, then you say, well, no, here's an AP image. Look, Reuters just ran this image a couple of minutes. It's on CNN right now. Um, suddenly it's because, wow, I guess this is real. Look at all this different stuff. So the ability, you think about it, in the old days, that would have taken you know maybe half a day of a good Photoshop person working at incredible speed to produce. Now I can produce that in real time, different angles from different media outlets, add different filtration to it. So again, this, you know, this idea of, well, I can believe it because there's all these different angles, there's all this different stuff, that's a huge deal. Do you think that you could maybe sketch out you know, what the history of GDELT is and, and then also discuss a little bit about how, how it actually works? Yeah, yeah. And let me come back to, um, I do think that one of the major inflection points today, not just generative AI, is the ability of AI to help us make sense of this deluge. And that really is at the core of GDELT. Um, and that, that's what I was trying to get to. Um, really at the core of GDELT lies this idea that we have this fire hose of data across the world. Human beings cannot make sense of this. This is really where machines uh, play such a huge role in allowing us to look, look across all this data. If you think about, GDELT really comes from this idea that 
Um, it really is what the OSINT world should have been. What Phibis and OSC and BBCM and BBCM Australia, um, this is what that world should have looked like. You should have seen this adoption of technology. You should have seen this pairing of humans and machines. Um, and you know, there's a variety of reasons why that did not end up happening um, that goes back to the, the root of, of why the OSINT world is not where it should be today, you know, really is what it could have been and what it should have been. When you say OSINT, what do you mean by that? Because uh, Open source intelligence. Yeah, we, we, we had a conversation. I'll put a link in the show notes to a gentleman named uh, Dr. Elliot Jardines, who is an OSINT uh, expert and has uh, deep uh, roots in the intelligence community as well. I'm, I, I'm just curious, have you... To, to the extent you can share, uh, have you had engagements with the intelligence community on? Well, he you, was actually, don't forget, he was, um, was it assistant DNI or associate? I, I forget the title, but uh, he was in I, the I DNI's office for OSINT. Correct. Um, yes, and in fact, that, that was correct. actually here for those two conferences, um, the 07 and 08 at Reagan, hmm. uh, but the Reagan building here, um, yeah, the Reagan, which one was it? Was it the Reagan building? No, it's, um, I don't which know. Is the, the one here. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, so there, there's there's a long history of that, um, but unfortunately, again, um, there's this long-standing, um, you know. So there are folks. Um, in fact, actually, I highly recommend folks uh, read my my old colleague's book, Tony Alcott, um, his book, um, "The uh, Open Source Intelligence in a Networked World," is a really fascinating look at, um, you know, from from the inside, um, you know, what 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 it really looks like is it from an analyst perspective. Um, to look at the world of OSINT, um, you know, and it is interesting, you know, you, you have this, um, you know, the different terminology and, you know, in my world, it was OSINT, you know, now today it's, was it publicly PAI, pub, publicly pub, accessible PAI, information? PAI, publicly available um, information, that's and, right. And yeah. you're seeing kind of the shift, um, you know, there, there's kind of the shift um, and simply also the accessibility. I mean, it may, you know, speaking of of the the OSINT conferences that that um, he opened um, in 07 and 08, what was, what was fascinating about that was, and the sidelines of those of those two conferences um, was really this coming. It wasn't really a coming of age, but this really intensifying of the shift um, to commercial satellite imaging. Now that had been going on for a very long time, uh, but it was just so fascinating. The sidelines of that conference, when you talk to folks, how much of the material, whether that was satellite imagery, whether that was signals intelligence, uh, whether you know not just classical OSINT, but things that typically were were only uh, dark side material. Um, you know, whether that's satellite imagery, signals intelligence, scooping up, uh, you know, live from space, from the ground, um, how much of that was being purchased from commercial con uh, companies now and was no longer being collected by the U.S. government itself. And, you know, fast forward to today, and it is interesting to me, the, the and I've written, I used to have a, a column actually in, in Forbes and then before that at Foreign Policy Magazine, and uh, a lot of, one of the themes of those columns, of a number of those columns, was this concept of that, so much of our collection now is not the government, it's not the intelligence community uh, doing, you know, what we see on the, you know, the the television. Um, it's just a commercial contract, just purchasing the data and uh, just flowing that in. Right. And, yeah. Something you know, Elliot told me in our in our podcast discussion was that uh, increasingly the president's uh, daily briefing book is is being fed increasingly by publicly available data rather than uh, information, not not rather than, but, you know, in, in addition to uh, information, which is collected by, uh, you know, intelligence assets. Well, and one of the most important things with, with open sources as well is, um, A, they allow you to see beyond. So one of the issues with, with other forms of collection is, again, adversaries know that you are collecting this, uh, they are very, you know, they there is a widespread understanding that um, what they say is, so you, you have a lot of falsehoods mixed into that. One of the interesting things with open sources is the degree to which they can act as a counterbalance to that, um, and the degree to which uh, even when you do know, um, you know, you have high confidence in, in, in a, 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 a non-public source, the ability to understand the difference in narratives. So Russia today is a great example of this. Um, you know, folks ask, well, why do you monitor Russia today? So for those that don't know, that's a Russian propaganda channel. That to us, so RT reflects the Kremlin's foreign propaganda arm. Where that becomes very powerful is that tells you um, what are the narratives that they are trying to promote around Ukraine? So you, we have both domestic Russian television and foreign Russian television. 
Um, and and that, that ability to look at that narrative. Now, if you are on the other side and you have live intercepts of the Kremlin's internal communications, that can be a very powerful thing to compare those two views and understand, well, what is the reality on the ground versus what are they promoting? Where do those align and where do those not align? And those those period, those 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 alignment and disalignment themes are really, really crucial uh, to understanding um, the to understanding where things might go. Um, what are they like? For example, in Ukraine, they are still running that narrative of Nazism to this day. They are still running that. Um, now that's very interesting because they have a lot of other stories. So one of the things that we find very interesting in Russian television is what are the narratives that we know are incorrect um, that they push? And then what's interesting is you can see um, how quickly those narratives go away. And that oftentimes can be a very clear signal of what, you know, behind the scenes, it can also almost be a verification signal, if you will. Mm, right. Well, um, okay. So I, I think I got us just a little bit off track. Um, so do you think you could talk a little bit about how does GDELT work? Uh, you know, what data does it ingest? How does how does it do it? How, how do you how do you keep track of uh, like uh, outlets uh, channels which pop in and out of existence? You know, could could you just kind of like un unpack that world just a little bit because I'm sure it's not a uh, I'm sure it's you know been a lot of trial and error and testing and experimenting and like ongoing uh, uh, you know, management as well. Exactly. So so the GDL project, um, so it it monitors a number of different things. So one is global online news coverage. Uh, today we cover almost every corner of the world. Uh, historically, we've monitored 150 languages, very soon to be 400 languages. Uh, we've translated in an interesting, uh, and I'll come back to this, um, the number of languages, uh, we also do radio in collaboration with the Internet Archive. Um, historically, we had some partners for print. Um, and then a major new collaboration is television in collaboration with the Internet Archive. Uh, with television, um, a selection of 100 channels from 50 countries on five continents over portions of the last 20 years, totaling around five and a quarter million broadcasts over 12 billion seconds of airtime. Um, over over um, And of that, um, for public analysis by researchers, um, almost a quadrillion pixels of data. And what's what and and a lot of that, so if you think about GDELT, it's both a production system that's designed to allow us to answer real questions. In fact, power is an ever greater fraction of global risk work, but also an exploratory sort of um, observatory of what does the future of AI look like? So for television, for example, when we started this, um there was a lot of fascinating questions about how do you analyze television? what 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 does that look like? So, for example, um, one of the things that we found uh, with television is, um, so for American television, it's closed captioned. For foreign television, we um, we use machine transcription and translation. Uh, for uh, Russian, Ukrainian, Belarusian, and Iranian television, we have almost a quarter of a million uh, broadcasts, only totally over a billion words of translated English to date uh, that are accessible for search. Uh, so that certainly makes it accessible. But another thing we found was the OCR. So taking the on-screen text and make that searchable, we found just how valuable that is to people that actually most researchers, they care less about the visuals of, of, and that was actually very surprising to us. What we expected is that using AI to actually look at the visuals of television would be an enormous leap forward. Um, but what we found is that for most people, they're not, analysts aren't used to thinking visually. You know, there's a few things, um, you know, there's a few within, uh, you know, the OSINT world, there's a few, there's a few sort of human-based uh, 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 instruments for a set for assessing visuals, but they're not great. It's never been a priority. And this to us is very interesting because um, whether we use categorical tools, so these are AI tools that sort of say, hey, there's a golden retriever, there's a mask, there's a soldier in this image. Um, but also what we what we found is that people don't under we've had to do a lot of education. I'll come back to this, a lot of education on how to use these tools. Mm -hmm. um, so a good example of this is what we had to do an exploration recently that showed on Russian television, the density of military imagery coincides directly with how they're performing on the battlefield. As they did poorer and poorer, less and less and less and less imagery of military, whether that's a picture of a tank, a picture of a soldier, uh, much more just in studio talking about things. And you know that was something that I expected that people would be able to do on their own. Um, but just again, just, just thinking about what that looks like, language is a huge, huge thing. And there's a fascinating anecdote with this. Um, so in the aftermath of the 2014 Ebola outbreak, um, at the time period, we were translating a, a, a growing fraction of material. 
So in the postmortem, we discovered we actually had the earliest glimmers of that in our data uh, from a broadcast partner that was monitoring local um, uh, uh, local radio in the forested regions of Guinea, um, but it was in French. And so we had these French language transcripts, but at the time period, we were only able to translate a small amount, so we missed that. Um, and we said, wow, you know, we got the earliest glimmers weeks before any of the biosurveillance systems picked up on this. Uh, imagine if we were actually able to look at, at language. So this involved this enormous leap forward that by the end of 2014, we were machine translating absolutely everything we monitored in 65 languages. Now, from a technical standpoint, um, that was an immense leap forward. Even the US intelligence community um, in its machine translation efforts was still tactical. You had to say, this article is of interest. I want this article translated. No one out there was saying, let's just translate. And part of that was just scale. Only in the cloud could you even imagine uh, performing something of that of that magnitude. Um, but again, in the cloud, it's it's, it's just CPUs. It's nothing. Um, and so for us, that unlocked a huge new door. Now, the reason that that story is so fascinating is a re, uh, fast forward to 10 p.m. Eastern time, December 30th, 2019. We picked up this enormous anomaly of a SARS-like viral of unknown origin in Wuhan, China. That the following morning, Blue Dot sent out this global alert, which was one of the very first alerts of COVID. But what was so fascinating is in that interstitial period, um, when we released this, it was it was just mind blowing to me the negative reaction, um, both from the academic and the intelligence community. Um, and the intelligence community really disappointed me in that there was this huge reaction of why would you look beyond English if it's not in a, a handful of American sources in English? In fact, one of the major counterterrorism, one of the major terrorism data sets that is used even by the U.S. government. Um, to study terrorism around the world. At the time period, it was based exclusively on American news outlets in English only. In fact, one of their top sources for ISIS, um, cataloging the nitty gritty of ISIS, was the Chicago Tribune and the Associated Press. And that just blew my mind. Um, and the reaction that we got was, why would you ever dream of looking at local sources in the local areas? Why would you do that? That's useless. Um, and to me, it's just sort of, this is what's wrong with the OSINT world. You're saying that people were questioning the... the value of looking beyond English. Now, there were certainly folks within the OSINT world, the OSINT world itself, within things like FIBIS, um, of course, they understand the value because that, that was the whole reason for existence. Um, but at those those more senior levels of government, that's sort of, you know, you think about FIBIS. FIBIS understands this. BBCM understands this because that's their bread and butter. But those products then are consumed at this higher value chain. And it's at that higher value chain, which, again, is, again, one of those perpetual uh, battles that things like OSC has long fought, uh, you know, the value of OSINT, the value of looking beyond. Um, but what was amazing to me is, you know, there were folks, there were actually um, projects that came out that said, look, um, unlike uh, GDELT, we only look at English. That makes us vastly superior uh, because we are only looking at English. And again, that, that, that reaction that you just had uh, is the reaction that I had at the time period of, how is this even possible? Um, you know, because remember though, this is the time period when so much of these projects that catalog global events, the New York Times was the dominant source. You had teams of human beings reading the New York Times every day and cataloging what was in there. And if it wasn't in the New York Times, it either didn't happen or it wasn't, it didn't matter. And so, you know, fast forward to today and we could say, well, how could you even imagine that? Of course, we have to look across the world. But that, you know, again, and that's been a thing time and time again with imagery, when we start looking at imagery across the world. Again, there was this reaction to, well, you know, imagery, why would you look at imagery? Just look at the text. It's so much simpler. We can keyword search. We can do these things. Yes, that's true. Uh, but images, if I'm reading about a massive flood uh, that um, destroyed a city, um, well, what is massive and what is destroyed? An image can tell me a lot more. And in fact, that was something we we early on um, got a lot of early uh, work on was disasters um, around the world and, and civil conflict. Looking at imagery, cataloging, triaging that. We don't even think about 10 years ago, um, it was science fiction to be able to take the, the fire hose of imagery that emerges. Let's say there's an earthquake in Turkey. To be able to take all that imagery that's appearing, just catalog that. Is this a map? Is this an aerial image? Is this a drone image? Is this a ground image? Does this show a building collapse? Does this show human morbidity? Um, that was science fiction 10 years ago. You mentioned translating. Uh, does does GDELT translate uh into other languages as well, so that researchers from, I don't know, France or uh, the Sudan, uh, that that they can consume GDELT in their native language as well? So GDELT, so initially we focus a lot on translation um, and mm -hmm. historically translation to English because that's where all the machine processing tools are. So if you want to do entity extraction, sentiment, event extraction, all these tools were English or maybe a few other languages. Geocoding, this is another interesting thing. 
Um, so 10 years ago, geocoding, just taking a piece of text and extracting out references to location in that text, um, this was actually something there was huge Department of Defense funding for. Uh, I mean, there were whole programs around extending this beyond English, because if I had Spanish language content, the universe of tools that could take a Spanish article and recognize references to even major cities uh, was, was really, really primitive. And we don't even think about that today. Um, and so historically, we focus on English. Today, that's 100 languages. Um, but now um, it's this interesting world where um, what we find, um, we have all these tools like ChatGPT, for example, that is multilingual, can handle all these different languages. What we find, though, um, take, per, uh, take Russian, actually. Russian is, not I think, a top five language for ChatGPT. If we hand a Russian language news article to ChatGPT and ask it questions about it, um, we get much less accurate results than if we machine translate that article into English and then proceed in English. So what we have found to date is that across uh, languages, if we translate the English first, you will get much better results, even on tools that were specifically designed for that target language. And that just reflects a lot of sort of the, the, um, the imbalance of training data. Um, also keep in mind for long tail languages, on paper, ChatGPT supports Burmese, on paper. On paper, there are a number of tools that, that have been custom built for Burmese. In reality, uh, what we find is their performance on Burmese is in some cases indistinguishable um, from random chance. Um, the oh, results are just so right. poor. Is and that so again, right? that's a that's a thing that we have these tools, but we still find going to English first tends to perform the best results. So that's why, but again, we now offer both options within GDEL, both things developed on the translations, and then again, that that um, the native language um, access to things like, like uh, word frequency tables and the like. The Information Professionals Association, for example, has a, a blog. We have a website. Is... IPA's data being sucked up into GDELT for analysis? Um, you know, it's a good question. Uh, for us, you know, again, everything's open. You can definitely look through the data. For us, you know, our what we kind of look at is we include anything that someone might treat as news. And that's mm. a very broad mandate. You know, a lot yeah, of so how, they, do, how do you identify that, I guess? I mean, you you don't do it onesie twosie, it must be done algorithmically. So actually, we, we we do a number of different ways. So one is um, every year we do kind of a wave. We basically, again, one of the benefits of being here in Washington, um, reach out through embassies and other mechanisms to national governments all across the world, press associations all across the world, and say, give us a list of all the press in your country and all the regional press. Now, again, that is always going to be very selective by country. Um, but again, also asking countries, what do you monitor globally? And so what you get is a very good um, sort of an interesting collection of media across the world. And then we augment that through various media um, lists. But what we find, um, a good example of this actually, I, we just put this up on our blog, um, like uh, take uh, Wikipedia, for example. A lot of people use that as a database. Uh, just did a great example of a Turkish news outlet that wrote about a uh, talk I gave in Turkey last week at the Stratcom Disaster Conference. According to the Wikipedia English edition, this outlet closed five years ago and is defunct. It ceased publication, ceased to exist, um, laid off everyone and no longer exists. And the info box, the metadata that machines can process also show that. Um, now, what's interesting is the Turkish version, on the other hand, says, well, the print edition ended five years ago and they switched to online only. And this is actually not a small outlet either. This is actually a large news outlet. Um, but again, it shows that, you know, even a country like Turkey for a relatively large news outlet, um, you have to look at local sources. Now, in that case, the, the Turkish Wikipedia at least has the correct data. But when we look at other countries around the world, Wikipedia, media databases, none of these um, bear any resemblance to the reality on the ground. Um, so we do a lot of working with local civil society groups. But then also one of the things that we look at is every article we monitor, we record all the links from that article outward. So in the case of Syria, when that um, when that really flared up, we started seeing, for example, the Syria Human Rights Observatory. We saw links from the New York Times say, uh, citing that as a news source. So now we know, hey, this is a source we need to add. So we can look at that kind of that, that we essentially construct a uh, you are here graph over the global news uh, media. And we can use that to kind of understand what are new sources of information that they are putting in. Now, again, that is not necessarily um, that is not necessarily true or false. Um, so RT, Russia Today, we include that because there are folks that consider that to be news or communities to which that would be considered to be news. And that is very, very crucial because what we find is a lot of the stories that end up being, uh, that end up moving things that end up being false, they start life in these farthest 
fringes of the sort of information ecosystem and then work their way to the forefront. So by monitoring those fringes and including things that you and I might not consider news, we might consider it to be a, a fake news site or a rumor mill, by including those, you can, you can trace out and say, hey, here's this narrative that's emerging. And oh, look, it's now making the leap to tier maybe five news outlets. Let's go ahead now and start looking at how that's spreading. That's, that's a huge thing there. So let's say somebody wants to experiment with GDELT or roll up their sleeves and, and start engaging. Um, what's the best way to start? And what are the basic tools or skills that someone needs to get started? You know, that's the thing. So, so GDELT is... General is, is enormous data set. Uh, a while ago, it was 8 trillion data points and climbing, and it's, it's just growing exponentially across many, many different data sets. There's not, you know, most people are familiar with our event data set, some familiar with our knowledge graph. Um, we have this, this wealth of new data sets now. Uh, and one of the challenges that we see there, it's at, we actually um, did a huge piece in our blog about this, um, the different user communities and how to support those. So this is something that's very interesting. Um, if you look at a lot of the work in the, the OSINT world that's designed for, for intelligence or corporate use, there tends to be this, this emphasis on these dashboards, um, this emphasis, especially on dashboards. We, we, we all know some of, of what I'm talking about, these, you know, these, these things with a million knobs and dials that look almost science fiction-y. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, what we find in real life, and that's a lot of that's because that's being driven by the contractor community. Um, it's being driven by folks that are paid to produce uh, you know, these, these immense infrastructure um, that ends up, if you actually look, in, and this is actually one of the really interesting things to me is, um, if you look downstream at these tools that are being ingested into the government, um, what percentage of those are actually ends up being used in real life at the end of the day? And what portions of those tools end up being used? Um, and there's this huge disconnect there. And in our own world, what we find is that, for example, journalists, they want something that they can fire up instantly as idiot simple that they can, because they're under immense pressure. They have a deadline. Uh, you know, a question was asked, um, is, uh, is, is, um, what's a good example of this? Uh, did uh, so President Biden made an announcement today about US Abrams tanks for Ukraine. Is that showing up on Russian media? How much and how and how quickly? Um, so they just need to fire something up, get an answer, and go. And they don't care necessarily about um, you know, all these little um little factors about well, what's the infrastructure behind that? What's the tooling? Um, you know, is it possible you may have missed one mention somewhere in there based on machine translation error? Mm -hmm. That's less relevant to them. Um, then you have sort of data analysts who want access to everything. They want normalization tables. They want to know the specific version number of the underlying models that are there. You have folks that want to do, um, and this is a huge thing for us. Um, we initially assumed that the world's largest organizations, these NGOs that are, you know, the NGOs, the household names that have data science teams and somewhere, sometimes data science teams with budgets larger than many companies, um, we just assumed that they could just ingest this data and work with it. And what we're finding is that even the largest um, NGOs with massive data science teams, incredibly skilled people, um, GDELT is in a world of its own. It's beyond anything that they can process. And so this has been a big, a big focus of ours is we just kind of assume that, you know, to me, a petabyte is nothing. Um, you know, in the, in the cloud world, a petabyte is just a file on disk. Uh, to most organizations, that's beyond their wildest dreams to analyze. Uh, even a terabyte of JSON data um, you know, to me, is something you analyze in a laptop today. To most organizations, that's still well beyond their wildest dreams. So there's been this huge focus for us of how do we digest this data down and make it accessible? Um, the workflows. So this is another thing. Uh, you know, to me, this this world of like, you know, think about Python today and all, and and TensorFlow and all these AI tools. You know, you just go, you take this code. You don't even have to write code. You just download this. It's, it, they make it so simple. You download this and run it. Um, but still that, you know, a lot of times maybe it requires a weird library, a certain GPU or a certain weird technical configuration. Um, and a lot of times it's not necessarily um, obvious how to then take the output of that and actually derive a question. I think that's a big thing is um, like facial recognition. This is a great example. Um, we have a whole program now looking at facial scanning of Russian television to catalog who's telling the story. Uh, and one of the things there, again, people have been doing facial analysis for obviously the beginning of, of computer vision. 
Um, one of the things that we found was that most of that work is turnkey tools, like Amazon has recognition. You hand an image, it tells you all the known faces. Um, that tool is deployed everywhere. But what we found, again, working with so many different communities is we found that actually with um, like Russian television of Ukraine, the things that people are interested in is not necessarily Putin. Um, they're interested in names that are the more obscure names, um, like the Wagner guy. I don't know. Maybe he's in there now. Um, but a lot of the names that people care about are not the names that are in these databases. And what we found is that what actually people wanted was to be able to tr to look at those more obscure faces, be able to count things like who's talking to whom on Teller, so co-occurrences of faces. Again, that's something people have done, but nobody had scaled that in an open world where you can just download the code and run it yourself. And so that's a huge thing that we are finding is um, the these creating these turnkey where, because again, even in cases where people have run these tools, so much of that tends to be, you know, where people say, hey, look, we've, we've, we've run this, here's our result. They don't share the code, or maybe they share the code, but it's, you know, how, how the heck do I actually run this? So we have a huge emphasis on everything that we do is public and open. So when we do an analysis like the thematic, the military imagery analysis, um, we put that up step by step by step, spin up a new virtual machine and the cloud vendor of your choice, and, you know, literally copy and paste this code and you're up and you're up and running. Um, even facial signatures. Well, what do I do with that? So I know these tools exist. I know they can generate these things, but how do I, how is that useful to me? So demonstrating the value, and that's a big thing to us is a lot of what we are doing is demonstrating um, what is the value of this and where also can it go horribly wrong? So speech recognition, um, Whisper is a tool from OpenAI, it's a speech recognition and translation. Hand it uh, a Persian language video and it will generate a real time English transcript for you. Um, it just, it went by, cause it was open and free. It, it went by wild, it just, it spread like wildfire in the community. Um, we saw major journalistic groups all across the world adapt it. Um, but nobody stopped. There were a few voices that said, you know, there's some problems with this. But most people said, you know what, who cares? It's free. Who cares what the problems are? So this is a case where we also play a huge role in actually spending the time and effort to say, well, what are the dangers? So actually taking this and having uh, the NATO Secretary General showing that in one of the cases, it took a Russian video and translated him as saying, Putin's absolutely right. NATO is a huge threat to him. He was completely justified with invading Ukraine. Um, and of course, that's completely opposite what he said. And you know that's a huge danger. If I'm taking that analysis and I'm using that in something that that translation, that has huge implications. And so the the um, or the Chinese spy balloon. We took a ChatGPT, the latest version, and ran an ABC News broadcast of the Chinese spy balloon six times. We ran it through ChatGPT six times. It took that broadcast and that became a new. It became either a satellite in space crashing to Earth, or in one of the cases, China actually detonated. They they fired a nuclear missile. It hit the American homeland. The American homeland is radioactive and American submarines are preparing to do a counter-strike. Um, what's so fascinating about this is when humans mislead, they tend to get a little bit vaguer. Machines, the, the level of detail there, um, you know, even the process, even the, the, the structure, well, the NSA is gonna issue a statement. Uh, the SecDef is gonna issue a statement. Mark Miley is gonna issue a statement. Knowing the principles and what they're gonna say and how they're gonna interact with each other in real life had this occurred, um, that all gets reproduced in these um, to a level of detail that had you been, you know, checked out, had you been sort of underground for a while and popped out, you say, my God, what just happened? Um, and the tools don't have, there's no, there's no confidence right now. There's no ability for me to ask, um, you know, how, you know, is this real? Or is this not? So those are the types of questions that we ask um, for this. So there's a lot of this exploratory work. And, and so, yeah, GDELT is enormous. Um, we are working right now on how do we make it easier for people to ask these questions um, in different communities, journalists, public health officials during COVID. We worked heavily with that community. Their interests are very different. A classical question that we got was um, like, here's a real life question we got. Um, we know most of the falsehood spreading right now about COVID vaccines. What are the emergent uh, falsehoods that are spreading each day? So that's the type of question that we get. Now, how do you answer that? We have the data for that, but it's this fire hose of data. How do you take this fire hose of data and answer a simple question like that? And what was interesting is that then was actually a two-part question. One was for the public health advisory, you know, so the actual decision makers, um, they just need to know what those narratives are. Um, for the analysts beneath it, they need to understand the velocity at what they're spreading to prioritize which of these do we focus on? And also, um, you know, is it even needed for us to respond to this? And so again, that level of detail of just the go, no-go versus those successive level of detail. So we, we did a whole piece on, 
understanding the toolkits, um, you know, and this goes down to the APIs, whether it's an API or a data set and the interfaces on through, you know, how do you, how do you, what we find is there is contrary to what you see a lot in the community, there is no such thing as a universal tool that is workable by everybody. Um, as much as the contractor community sells these tools that they claim is the universal dashboard that sells all, um, what we find in real life, if you actually sit down and, and look at not what is being made available, but what is actually used for real life Q and A or you real life actionable usage, um, what we find is customized dash uh, customizable um, that have the specific needs of each community, uh, and and that's been a huge thing for us is how do you kind of learn and work with each community and then deploy the specific summarizations and tools that they need to answer the questions that they have. Mm -hmm. Do you get the impression that uh, GDELT is being used by so many different communities um, and growing potentially, right? There's, you know, lots of different stakeholders are plugged in to GDELT that uh, GDELT is, is getting too big to fail. Like what? Like what if what if GDELT were to just to disappear today? How many people would freak out? I mean, GDELT today, you know, it's really fascinating. I mean, it really powers, um, you know, the the global risk community. I mean, you know, you could say, well, what would happen if Twitter goes away? Well, we're actually getting an answer on Twitter. Uh, you know, we are seeing kind of this this chaos there. Um, and you know, at the you know, and so you know, you 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 have this question: What would happen if the internet went away tomorrow? You know, they, I mean, these are these are fascinating questions. Are these questions that people have asked you before? Um, you know, so so GDL actually, I mean, GDL today really does power an ever growing fraction. What was fascinating to me about GDL because it is open data, mm -hmm. um, it powers so much directly or indirectly. So it, it's amazing. Um, like take COVID, for example, take a natural disaster occur somewhere in the world. Oh, it is interesting. Uh, you know, I, I tend to have sort of early warning of anything occurring across the world, mostly because sort of the deluge of Q&A of, you know, an earthquake occurs before it's even showing up on social media. Uh, you know, I'm getting queries from disaster response teams and others saying, hey, you know, we've got folks in the ground. Can you, you know, how do we produce a live feed? Um, and, and usually, you know, major organizations, they already have GDEL's been fully integrated into their workflows. Um, but every time something occurs, you'll see kind of this uh, this flurry of new questions from new organizations that maybe have not used, they know of GDELT, but they've never really used it in this way before saying, well, hey, how do we onboard this live feed? Um, you know, how do we do uh, this? And so there's definitely, um, you know, and, and it is interesting because GDELT shows up in so many unexpected places uh, because it really, what you'll see is someone will produce a report based on GDELT and that'll get summarized and summarized. So GDELT's name is not always attached uh, to where it ends up being used, um, but it is, you know, and it is, it, it's a really powerful, fascinating, um, you know, A, it's, it's just fascinating the degree to which we are able to help the world. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and one thing that that is especially um, especially meaningful to me is, um, so U.S. Um, Institute of Peace, um, one of the folks there, Noel Dickover, used to have this saying, data for Superman. And, you know, he used to talk about um, how, you know, so much of, of what governments and others do is, like the United States government spends, obviously, a, an absolute fortune on an, analyzing the world to produce reports for the president of the United States. Now, take a case like Sudan right now. You don't need a supercomputer or uh, an intelligence agency to tell you there's something happening there right now. Um, there's some really horrible things happening there right now in terms of impacts on civilians. Um, but the United States government, on the other hand, is not, you know, the US military is not going to march into Sudan and do a peacekeeping mission right now. It's just not politically viable. Um, same thing in Ukraine. We're providing weaponry, but, you know, we're not going to ship a quarter of a million troops into Ukraine right now from the US, uh, US military. Uh, this is not going to happen politically. Um, it could, you know, certainly our military could do these things, but politically it's not. So providing this data to the president of the United States, um, you know, in Sudan, you know, certainly, I mean, I'm sure that's doing some good, but that's not helping people on the ground. The thing that would help people on the ground is taking this data and providing it to real life people on the ground to help them understand the chaos of what's happening around them. And so to me, some of the most meaningful work that GDELT does 
um, is provide this data that actually ends up going to people on the ground um, through sometimes through NGOs and others, sometimes directly um, through the universe and ecosystem of tools. And so to provide able to provide someone that's on the ground to be able to say, hey, you know, look, uh, like in uh, Nigeria, if you are on the ground uh, back when, you know, back in the sort of peak Boko Haram era, to be able to say, you know, the government, the U.S. government is not sending the U.S. military into, into Nigeria. Um, on the other hand, uh, people on the ground, like they need actual help. Um, telling the president of the United States, hey, Boko Haram is heading to this area. That's not doing people on the ground any good because the U.S. isn't going to react to that. Um, I mean, maybe we send some extra uh, equipment and such. Um, but being able to sell someone on the ground and be able to show them a map and say, hey, um, here are the live reporting of this moving in your area, um, that has huge implications. Um, being able also to, to help, um, so one of the things that we looked at with the Turkish earthquake um, in real time, uh, and this is actually a huge area that we think that, that there's a huge, huge potential for. So in real time during the earthquake, now this, we did not deploy this to the public, um, but one of the things that we deployed was we looked at these large language models like ChatGPT and BARD, and we asked, what could they do in a crisis situation like that to help the general public? So one of the things that we demoed um, was looking at um, taking real time, because people are on social media, they're on these platforms saying, hey, you know, I've got a friend here, he's, he's broken leg, for example, um, uh, or someone saying, hey, there's a crushing injury or this or that. Um, you know, the problem is that the government just, you know, as, as fast as you can, there's still that delay. Could you have machines? And the answer is yes, that can triage all this. And you just give the machine say, here are the major contacts for crushing and other, um, uh, other like really urgent air, give them this contact. If they're in this location, if they're in this location, give them this. If it's a broken leg here. So have this and just say in real time, the machines are actually good enough right now that they can take those tweets as someone's tweeting it within a fraction of a second, respond back and say, um, I understand that you say you're in this area and you have a broken leg. Here's the contact information. It's actually two miles this way. There's a medical facility for that. Um, you have a crushing injury with this, um, you know, contact this and they'll be there. Um, that real time triaging, real time combating of falsehoods. Um, you know, there's all these falsehoods of, oh, go here, there's all this food and water and medical supply. And some of that was was well-meaning, some of that was malicious. People want to get people out so they can uh, get access. Um, and so the ability to, in real time, say, and we, we've demoed this, um, here are a set of known falsehoods, find falsehoods, not just mentioning, because maybe someone says, hey, don't believe this, this is false. Being able to find things that are actually promoting that and then respond to that. Um, we did a demo of this um, with Iranian state media. I mean, to tell you the the the... the the state at which these tools are at right now, we literally, in a live demo, took Iranian state television, had it monitor that um, real-time transcription of Persian, real-time translation to English. And we had ChatGPT monitor that for any reference to the to the nuclear accord, find any reference to it. Is it pro or con? If it's pro, ignore it. If it criticizes the nuclear accord, then, and I mean, this is amazing. Then, take, and this is actually the point at which I got really concerned about the large language models. Take that negative that negative reference, refute it point by point by point by point, make it pro-US, pro-nuclear accord, write it in Persian and English, write a version for Twitter, a version for LinkedIn, a version for an American news outlet, a version for an Iranian news outlet. And literally all this, a few little prompts, and it does it, and it generates each of those, and, and also generate the imagery to illustrate each of these. Now, the scary part is when you reviewed that, it actually exceeded the quality. When we asked some folks to review this, it exceeded the quality that the that U.S. government, like State Department, what they actually produced through their crisis and other rapid response communications, um, it beat that by a long shot. Um, now, for Persian, it missed some of the context. You didn't have some of the, the sort of contextualization. But what, what it was described to me as is the, the language itself was, flu was perfectly fluent. It was written as a, a someone of Iranian descent who grew up in the U.S., um, who maybe is is kind of out of sort of the contextualization. For for example, like Russian, dead on. Um, and this is, again, you can tune it a little bit. But what amazed me is when we asked people to compare this against things that the U.S. government has put out, um, it was it beat that by a long shot. Um, and that's because, again, you're kind of prioritizing speed for a lot of this. You just, you know, it's high volume, it's, it's mechanized. Um, and the ability to do that in real time, now in a crisis response, being able to take like a good example of this is, um, you know, a number of years ago uh, when I was at Georgetown, uh, one of our ambassadors that was rotating back was talking about an incident where 
Um, they had all of a sudden people are, are marching on the embassy and they're frankly trying to figure out, you know, no one's mentioned what is this? Are they friendly? Are they, you know, are they here to torch the embassy down or are they just here to talk? Uh, you know, they seem very angry. What's going on here? And, you know, that has everything to do with how you respond to this enormous mass of people marching on your embassy. Um, you know, that has life and death consequences. Um, the ability for machines to a be able to alert you in real time hey look this is actually on the radio right now this is what they're telling them um and then b maybe to counteract that of you know look on the radio right now uh they're saying that the that that um you know that that um that vaccine group that you just did you went out and did a polio vaccine that that was actually a poison that you were injecting in them um to be able to um be able to counter that in real time where you know again and, and the best thing about machines is they're not as good at reasoning but they're good at stalling they're good at kind of saying well here you you know, let's talk about this. Let's kind of to buy you that time to come up with a good response. Um, and that's, again, one of the things that Gino is looking at is for us, it's what is the state of things? What is possible? Um, what works? What doesn't work? Where are the limitations? Where are the strengths? Uh, and then be able to look at, um, you know, where is the future hold? So Gino, there's both a production data set and observatory of what are the tools that we can deploy right now that have real, real implications to understand media. And then what will the future hold? And, and that's, a, that's a big thing for us. On the GDELT website, it's gdeltproject.org. It says that uh, it's supported by Google Jigsaw. What does that mean? Yeah, so we're a part of a public data sets program. Uh, so Google has a public data sets program. So they host the data uh, for free. Um, we have, you know, we've had past support from the National Academies, from the World Bank, um, you know, from, you know, we've done collaborations in the past with the U.S. Army. Um, and actually, the U.S. Army was another uh, great example. So that was U.S. Army Searle, uh, I think maybe 10 years ago. Uh, we did a, some fascinating work around JSTOR. So um, one of their tasks, one of the things that we worked with them on was this notion of, let's say the U.S. Army is deployed to build a school somewhere. Um, what are the implications there? The local government might say, well, build a school over here. Um, and maybe we don't know any better. Uh, but in reality, it's because maybe there's an ethic group, maybe they're one ethic group, and the, and maybe they're built a school there because they know that will deprive another ethnic group of access to that school, for example. Um, and so one of the things is, is academic literature. I mean, look at Afghanistan. When the U.S. went into Afghanistan, all the lessons that were learned at great cost about the social cultural landscape, none of this was new. Um, none of this was, wow, we had no idea about this. These were all lessons. In fact, even the U.S. government, um, if you look backwards through time, we had all that social cultural data. It just wasn't accessible easily. And so what we looked at there was, so JSTOR, in that particular case, made accessible um, their entire holdings in Africa and the Middle East, over 2,000 plus journals. And we, we did machine processing and all that. So you could actually make a map and say, we're going to build a school in this area. Um, here are the, the, the context around that. And then it could go through and tell you, here's the articles. Um, it's kind of like what you would do through chat GPT today. Here are the sensitivities that are going to be involved there. Um, and that to me was really eye-opening that, you know, that was such an important and kind of um, meaningful uh, thing to be able to just take this academic literature, go through the citations database and say, here are the top academics that specialize in that topic in that area. Um, so it's just been a, a huge, in fact, actually my, my dissertation work um, really was around this idea of, um, how can we scale up using machines to understand and predict global, global conflict? Um, and so in that particular case, LexisNexis actually made accessible um, a lot of their content for that, for my dissertation. So it's, just a, it's a huge um, ecosystem of folks around the world providing data, providing compute support, uh, providing um, expertise. Um, it's just this huge, um, you know, because it really is this idea of what if compute power was infinite? Um, what you know? What really becomes possible? And, and you actually look up. So my undergrad was computer science, uh, and my PhD is information science. And you know, there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is, I you know, I I founded my first company back in 1995, the very early days of the web. Worked at NCSA as an undergrad and grad uh, grad student. Um, actually, you know, with which actually some of the remnants of the Mosaic team and and others that were at sort of the forefront of a lot of this. Um, and to me. Um, and it, it's funny because actually, uh, as a as, as a high school intern, we were actually running where the time period was one of the largest web crawling infrastructures, and in, I think it was actually the largest in academia and one of the largest in the world. Um, just scraping the open internet 
um, and asking these same very questions. And in fact, uh, we talked about large language models. Back then, 20, almost 25 years ago, almost a quarter century ago, uh, we were building what at the time period were large language models. So when we, when people look at ChatGPT and they say, my God, look what it can do. Well, to me, it's, it's actually not that exciting because we were doing that back then. Again, the scale of the data was smaller. So the accuracy was less. It was less, it was less human-like, um, but the capabilities were there. Um, and what was interesting about a lot of that work um, is is actually the unexpected nature of that. We would get, um, we would actually get um, organizations that would sponsor, for example, they want to understand crop uh, techniques across the world. Like how are people growing crops um, in other parts of the world? What can we learn about that um, from the internet, from early citizen media, from early uh, material that was on the web? Um, you know, things that, you know, this long predates social media. And, you know, the reason I moved from computer science to, to um, information science is my interest really is what we can do with all this. It's not computer science teaches you machines for machines sake. My interest is machines are tools. Um, they're a tool like any other. What do they allow us to ask? And in information science, um, one of the things that we talk a lot, which has had a huge impact on what I do with GDEL, we talk about use and users of information. This idea that um, you might think an artist, like you think about a normal person, ordinary person would say artists must have bookshelves full of art books. Um, in information science, what you learn is they actually don't. Um, the fact they very they typically have no art books. Their books are history books. Their books are other types of books that that give them the idea and the context of what they're drawing. And so it really teaches you to think about the end person, the person who's that decision maker, what is the information that they need to make that decision? What does the information landscape look like? Both um, legitimate information and then falsehoods and then poisoned falsehoods. What does that look like? How do we process information? How do societies, you think about very few of us are in Ukraine, have been to Ukraine lately. The majority of Americans, absent a very small number, um, most of what they understand about that is through information uh, from afar. How does that work? What's that cycle look like? So that knowledge and that way of thinking has had a huge impact, um, is really, really diffused into what GDEL is today, um, is again, thinking about, um, you know, the, just the, the information landscape. Fascinating project, uh, fascinating, um, extremely relevant <laughs> to um, uh, the way people are engaging with the world today and in a national security context, uh, which is, um, you know, tends to be a big focus for this podcast forum. And so um, thank you for all of your efforts, um, Kalev, as well as I'm sure uh, other folks who are who with whom you're collaborating. And with that, Kalev Litaru, thank you so much for being a guest on the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks so much for having me and definitely check out our blog, blog.gdeltproject.org. Um, you will just see the wealth of data sets and analyses that we do each day um, exploring the world around us. Thanks so much for having me. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.